So good morning and good afternoon, uh, everybody. And thank you for joining us today for this first webinar of the NGI Atlantic that you project. And first of all, on behalf of the consortium, um, we, we want to uh, hope you're all in, in good um, health um, in, this, in this period with, uh, with your families. So um, uh, the, the webinar, um, we, we reached a, a very interest in, in this webinar. We, we have uh, almost uh, 19 interested uh, participants today, and we are um, extremely happy to have with us uh, Peter Vatelnik, Minister Councillor for Digital Economy Policy at the Delegation of the European Union of the United States today, uh, who is going to open in this webinar. Um, I'd uh, like now to give the floor to Jim Clark, uh, who is uh, a European Pro Program Manager at the Waterford Institute of Technology, and he is the NGI Atlantic.eu Project Coordinator for a quick welcome. And then we will move on with the agenda that we have today with the speaker. So in addition to uh, Mr. Fetelnik, we We'll then uh, listen to Ivan Seskar from the Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, which is one of the partners of the uh, NGI Atlantic uh, project. And, and then that's me, Sara Pitonet from Trust IT uh, in Italy. So Jim, uh, floor to you. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. We're very excited that we're soon to be opening our first uh, open call for ngiatlantic.eu and we'll be presenting this uh, to you today. And <clears throat> we're delighted to have with us uh, Peter Fatonig, who is the Minister Council for Digital Economy Policy, Shade Delegation of the European Union <clears throat> to the United States, and who was also you know, tirelessly working on you know, the NGI initiative from the very start. So we're, we're blessed to have Peter with us today. So with that, I would like to turn the floor over to you, Peter. Jim, many thanks. Uh, greatly appreciate to be part of that webinar and, and, and be able to talk a few words in the beginning. I, I hope all my message is reaching you fine out there from wherever you are connecting from your living rooms, kitchen or basements. I have seen a lot of living rooms the last 10 days as you see mine in the background. I hope also your loved ones are fine. It's, it's difficult times for many of us, but at the same time, I, I hope you will find some of the messages I would like to pass also motivating. As Jim has said, I'm working out of the EU office here in Washington, DC. I'm responsible for digital economy policy. So that line of work includes all kind of policy objective we are pursuing with the United States, be it artificial intelligence, the general industrial policy, cybersecurity, or joint work on disinformation or content moderation, all the platform aspects like liability, supply chain security, and on and on and on. So I think it's a broad portfolio, but also kind of very rewarding as, as pretty much uh, we talk about the future of economy and society here. And in my introduction, I would like to pass three messages. I uh, would like to have it limited just to those three. The first one is this, this work you will be doing and, and the project funded by NGI Atlantic is work among researchers and you will be working on research challenges. So that's clearly the objective. But if that were to be the objective or the only objective, we would not necessarily need a US collaboration. So why are we calling for an EU-US partnership in, in this initiative? And there are a couple of elements I, th I think you may want to consider in, in preparing your bid or reflecting when, when you think about participating in this call. The first one is there's clearly a political objective. The EU-US relationship is changing. Uh, I think you all have heard about that by now. And that, in fact, has very little to do with the current administration. The seeds of that were there a long time ago, and they will outlast the current administration definitively. There are, for this change, there are exogenous factors such as the rise of Europe, the rise of China, and America's role in the world is being reflected upon very heavily in this country. 
There are endogenous factors uh, such as growing social divide, populism, the decline of manufacturing, and even the decline of innovation, which is hard to sustain. So an EU-US project builds this people-to-people -people relationship, which or, or these links between organizations where people actually understand itself. So you are contributing with a project here to that EU-US relationship. Because at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, you're going to be an ambassador of, of Europe. I mean, the, the way you describe, the way Europeans think about certain, certain issues are not exactly the same as people think here. Even if we think EU and US are very like-minded, they are in terms of values, but the approach can be quite different at the end of the day. Which brings me to my other objective for, for such a project, which is talent. And with all respect, and I have a high esteem for European researchers, and I have worked for a long time in, in, in research. Uh, the academic environment here in the US is excellent, is first class, it is very challenging. It's very fast, it's probably more ruthless in the ambition and in the exploitation of research than what I see back home. Uh, essentially, research is very often seen as a first step to to make a lot of money, and making a lot of money is not a crime. Uh, it is understandable if you were to live here and if you want to raise a family in Boston, you better have a salary of $300,000 a year. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very hard. So money is a very useful thing and you see that the academic sector is on the pathway of, of allowing people to make a lot of money. And researchers and entrepreneurs actually think a lot alike. Uh, this, I mean, you know that probably better than me that taking risk is natural to, to both of those groups of people. Logic tends to prevail in decision making and there is an appetite for success. And even if I may say, sometimes I see a lot of appetite for, for the glory in this success. So, so that's good. And that's something I think European researchers can benefit in this cooperation. And finally, there is the research objective. Achieving, a, achieving what you set out to do, making the difference, the success. In, in doing so, I, I think it would be interesting if you reflect upon how, how you would see, um, now let me rephrase that, how you would try to remember those who support you in doing that. I think there's a bit of a European pride we would have as well like to transport in, in such initiatives and messages. The US is doing things very fine, nothing wrong. Europe is doing things very fine, nothing wrong. They may be different, both should be happy, both should be ambitious. So it's not about getting the same thing. It's not about uh, succeeding in, in, in a way both, both don't feel happy. No, both should be feeling happy and move forward. Now that was a very long one on my first. So the second and the third one are gonna be a lot shorter. The second one is, uh, you all know the research challenge is much better than me and I don't pretend to, to know the, the, the topics very well. But if you allow me one advice and, uh, and that's going to be uh, around uh, 5G and the open radio access networks. There's a lot of talk here in the United States of creating an ecosystem for open radio access network technologies, which means hardware, obviously 5G rounds of pieces of hardware, but probably much more important the software, which is going to enable that because it's going to be this atomization of 5G in smaller interoperable components. And, and if everybody, anybody is out there, I, I would, like to encourage you to look quite careful because I can see in, in a few months from now, and this can go very quick, massive initiatives coming out and trying to see how, how to build that, that kind of Oran type of future for either 5G or, or 6G. So that's the only research advice I, I, I would like to, to give you. And the third element in my introduction is this type of action is very different. You probably have noticed that when you registered for the seminar and you looked at the flyer and the documents describing the initiative. So you're probably a bit curious as well, how is this gonna work? Who is this really addressing? Uh, that's, uh, it's, it's different from the traditional big and sometimes slow Horizon 2020 projects. We talk here about speedboats. We talk here about focused actions which within a very short period of time 
can make a big difference. We talk about an agile project and those who are in the software world, we talk about a scrum-like thing, you know, a solid research sprint, which will take us from point A to point B within a couple of months, maximum six months, and make, make a difference. Uh, and we, we think and we hope this will attract also new types of, of researchers, people who are not necessarily interested in the big thing, but getting something specific done, using this as well as a learning experience and moving their career forward. Finally, as, as I said, this is going to be a new thing. Uh, so consider yourself as, as a pathfinder, as a vanguard for a concept. If it works well, I presume the commission is going to use more of this smaller speedboat type of actions, which should complement the big initiatives, which then you see public-private partnerships, which go up to a billion or, or more. But this cannot, the billion cannot replace the, the many, many small speedboat type of initiatives and actions which are going to be launched through this sort of concept. Finally, uh, closing, the, the ongoing health crisis, I think is also an opportunity. Frankly, you know, that's, that's how, how humans function. Every, every problem will soon be turned around into an opportunity and how can we move forward? I hear and, and read a lot right now here in the United States of uh, yes we can mentality. Uh, people coming out with solutions, people trying to move forward, positive messages. So I think the timing of this initiative is really, really good because there's a lot of fertile ground. People are hungry to get something done. Um, and, and in that sense, the resilience of the, the US society is quite impressive and I'm deeply impressed by that. So I hope that working in such an initiative, you will also be able to soak up part of that yes we can mentality and be part of that moving forward with society and the economy in the best possible way. And with this, thank you for listening to my short introduction. I hand back to Jim. I'm not sure how you want to deal. Are there any questions allowed or, or how you want to move forward? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes, I'd leave the floor to Jim and I invite all participants to use the chat box or the question and answer box in case you have any questions and we'll be happy to take them on at the end of the webinar. Thanks. Jim, floor to you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your opening. And um, you've touched um, uh, quite a lot about the uh, NGI initiative and, and I'll just compliment that for a few minutes with, with a bit more uh, details about the initiative uh, itself. Um, <clears throat> Can you move to the next slide, Sarah, please? Okay, so the NGI initiative, um, go back to the previous slide, Sarah, please. Uh, the NGI initiative was launched in, by the European Commission in the autumn of 2016. And as Peter was saying, it aims to do things very differently from the research and development activities of past programs the NGI initiative aims to shape the future internet as an interoperable platform ecosystem that embodies the values that Europe holds dear, uh, addressing challenges such as um, uh, restoring trust, um, protection of personal data, ensuring privacy, security, and inclusion, and reflects the European values and norms. Uh, since, it, since its launch, the initiative has been developed to drive this uh, technological revolution by attracting smaller scale project teams um, with an, an express emphasis on high impact innovators to bid for regular open calls on a number of relevant NGI topics, uh, which, which uh, we will cover in more detail later. Um, now, as I mentioned previously, NGIs attract in the oftentimes harder uh, to reach innovators that wouldn't ordinarily participate to the larger research and innovation programs, um, perhaps due to the administrative burdens um, or for, for other reasons. And to attract these top talents, 75 million euros of grants are directly supporting, uh, in some cases, individual researchers uh, and developers and startups and uh, social innovators. 
And <clears throat> to accomplish this, the East, uh, the European Commission is funding research and innovation actions that are acting as intermediaries, which have 20% of their budget um, for the consortium to select, monitor, mentor, and train and build a community. And 80% uh, um, of the, the budget is used for, to fund the open calls and the individual projects among the third party researchers, developers, high tech startups and SMEs. And then um, the NGI initiative also builds on coordination and support actions to ensure a synergy across all of these stakeholders with focus on outreach, community building, business acceleration, policy and strategic programming, and, um, and uh, in the space that we're in, the EU-US collaboration. So here are the topics that are um, currently open in the NGI initiative and the projects uh, that are, um, are, are the, the research and innovation action projects that are funding the open calls. So there's privacy and trust enhancing technologies, which has two RIAs uh, working, the NGI Zero PET and NGI Trust. They've been running for about a year or so. Decentralized and um, I would say better data governance uh, has the NGI Ledger project, uh, which has also been running for about a year, year and a half. Then discovering identification technologies, um, looking at better ways of search and discovery, that's NGI Zero Discovery. And then more recently started uh, NGI Research and Innovation Actions um, on strengthening internet trustworthiness with electronic identities, that's NGI ESIF Lab. Service and Data Portability, uh, which is NGI DAPSI and Open Internet Architecture Renovation, which is NGI Pointer, and then ourselves, the EU-US collaboration on NGI. Next slide. Sarah, thank you. So then as I mentioned, um, the, the projects uh, sort of almost the backbone, I would say, of of our work is supported by five ongoing coordination and support actions. The NGI for All project is um, uh, the coordinating the NGI outreach office. Think Nexus, which is uh, reinforcing EU-US collaboration through its dedicated think tank. NGI Explorers, which is conducting immersive missions to the USA for top European research and innovators. The NGI Forward Project, which is the strategy and policy and research agenda um, coordination and support action. And then TETRA is uh, looking at the business acceleration for all of the RIA projects. So they're very, very important projects as well. Okay, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll now describe a bit more about ngiatlantic.eu. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So let's introduce our project. So NGI Atlantic from starting, started in January uh, 2020 and throughout June 2022, it will fund um, EU-based researchers and innovators to carry out NGI-related experiments together with uh, um, research teams based in the United, uh, United States. Five open calls will be launched uh, between April 2020. Uh, the first call is going to be open on the 1st of April until November 2021. Uh, projects um, will, uh, will, uh, it will fund projects with funds ranging from 50,000 to 150,000 euros for a total uh, budget of 2 million euro funding for uh, European organizations. Five webinars will be organized, such as this one, this is the first of the series, to guide applicants through the course priorities. And four workshops were, uh, were foreseen originally to uh, explain all the, the calls into details, and then we will see how we will manage to, to turn them into virtual sessions um, considering the, the, the time frame and the current situations. Uh, samples of relevant areas uh, in, in NGI where the calls will be, uh, that the calls will be addressing uh, include 
5G, big data, Internet of Things, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. And uh, we will see later on uh, which are the core topics uh, of the first of this open course. So the main features of the uh, key features of the project are, uh, as said, the open calls and the budget available for NGI experiments to be funded, but also the project leverages on uh, a group of experts, so an external advisory uh, group who is mainly uh, working to monitor the um, evolution of the, the open calls and uh, to, to ensure that uh, the key topics are assessed. And then there is an external pool of evaluators uh, who is being selected via an open call, which is open already, to ensure um, a fair uh, evaluation of the uh, applications themselves. Uh, last but not least, we have a twinning lab, and I'm going to spend two uh, words uh, in, in the following slides about this to um, uh, help you uh, in finding partners um, across the, the ocean. Uh, what's important is that NGI Atlantic will offer a continuous coaching and mentoring from the pre-proposal stage until the, uh, the, the end of the experiment in order to uh, exploit and maximize the, the outcomes of the experiments themselves. So as said, the, uh, the project set up um, a twinning lab, which is a space uh, for researchers, innovators, and startups from both uh, continents to discover and connect with the transatlantic actors and start establishing partnerships in order to the open. So uh, the invitation there is to join the Twinning Lab by connecting online to showcase your expertise in the NGI sector and find the ideal partners to carry on the uh, experiments. The open calls are um, uh, organized by cascade funding. So it is a cascade funding mechanism said to fund researchers and innovators to carry out NGI-related experiments on specific uh, teams, uh, such as um, privacy and trust in houses technologies, uh, decentralized data governance, discovery and identification technologies, and all of them will be monitored uh, during the project time frame and will um, evolve uh, call by call. So we're really invited to stay tuned uh, with us since each call will have a specific topic to, to be addressed. Yeah, and now uh, we'll continue with a deep dive into the details of this first uh, open call that will be launched next week. Um, Jim, do you want to share your, your screen or it, it's fine. I can also um, move on it's slides. Okay, you, you can move on. Okay. But, um, be, before uh, I move on, there's a question yeah. here for Peter. Um, in, in yeah, the, there are a few questions. Yeah. Um, would it be a good time to do it now, do you think? Or can we wait till later? Yeah, maybe we can we can raise the question to Peter since uh, in the case you might need to leave early. So there was one question. <coughs> yeah, it was already answered uh, live by Silvana Mustella. So asking how can politicians in Washington uh, and U.S. counterparts uh, could stimulate the innovators working on on the project, so on NGI Atlantic, to make a better, a bigger impact. Yeah, no, I see it. You're recording this message, so I got to be careful a little bit in what I'm <laughs> saying. But uh, I think classic politicians cannot be much of a specific help in this context. Uh, I think they are much more the, the enabler setting the scene. And and what is needed here is that organizations like like yourself, you know, uh, Trust IT and and then the other partners in this project, or Jim and then the colleagues. Uh, build a community and lead that community to success. That's, that's, that's sort of the first and primary objective without it, anything else completely worthless. What you see today is, and this is where politicians came in, a desire for action. I mean, yesterday the US Congress has, has closed a $2 trillion 
stimulus package. That's a lot of money, a lot of money, and a lot of it will go into innovation. Maybe just a fraction of it, but it's still a lot of money. Same is happening in Europe. I think it will be fairly easy to have agreements on, on how much should go into the, into the future research program now, because people are interested to invest in the future. So that's a political side. But as I said, first and foremost, if we don't get innovative ecosystems working, where should the money go? No, no value. Thanks, Peter. Do um, you want to read the second question as yeah. well, or should I type them? No, uh, I, I think I would read it quickly, if you, if you like. And sure. So from Martin uh, Serrano. Um, due to the attractive uh, link to the idea of a speedboat project, so is there any preference towards having uh, submissions in place of types um, new from scratch, disrupt ideas or uh, follow-up activities on conservation activities? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a difficult question uh, because it's like as, as soon as I were to give some indication people would think this this is sort of the desirable. I don't think there's a preconceived clear idea of what would be the best way to move forward. However, you know, put yourself in the situation of an evaluator. Anything which is concrete and makes a different difference between point A and point B is 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 what they are looking for. So it needs to be concrete, it needs to be actionable. And I'm not sure sometimes if disruptive ideas can be as actionable. So probably the sweet spot is ideas which linger around for quite some time, things which have been sleeping in a drawer, can be pulled out, can be shaped into an action which is suitable for this, for this initiative, and then tabled. Uh, I, maybe I'm sounding not ambitious enough here, that could well be. But I think it needs to be really sort of delivering this difference between A and B and not necessarily being vague and, and, and not achieving its success. Better small success and real success than not having achieved much uh, over, over three to six months. Thank you. Thank you. And there is a last one, a very last one that I think we can pick up now is from Dan Caprio. So uh, with reference to transatlantic cooperation, <clears throat> how do you imagine funding for policy projects, especially from the academics? Uh, and he is referring to US partners since the call will fund the EU um, partners only. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And, and uh, I, I know that has been a, a continuous question for probably the last 10 years already. And I'm not sure if I have a, a solid answer to that. It's true that the EU initiatives fund the, the EU side of it. Now the question is, will there be additional funds become available on, on, the, Europe, uh, on the American side? And as you say, especially non-academics, because uh, US research funding, at least in the current form, very much targets the academic sector and leaves away the other, the other innovation actors in, in this innovation chain here in the US. Uh, I, th I think what I would like to, I would like in particular in the, in the context of the stimulus package, maybe go back to, to some parts of the NSF and you know, there is a new fund, mm -hmm. the New Science and Technology Foundation, the NSTF uh, is coming up and running. And I wonder if they wouldn't be able to pick up the non-academic uh, researchers in this world and support them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we we can probably move on, move on now, <coughs> Jim. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the main goal of the uh, open calls um, of NGI Atlantic.eu um, are to incentivize the EU US. Um, the previous slide, Sarah. Sorry. It's, <laughs> it's okay. It was um, not on it, purpose. It's to incentivize the EU and US NGI teams to carry out experiments using. Uh, EU and or US based experimental uh, platforms. Uh, and just some of the statistics of the uh, open call itself. So the duration is the 1st of April until the 29th of May 2020 at 1700 uh, CET. Then the evaluation and notification will take place in June, uh, the month of June. Uh, the total indicative funding available for the open call is 600,000 euros. The first open call 
Um, the expected start dates, um, the turnaround will be quick. Um, so it would be 1st of July, 2020. And there's two types of proposals. There's a long-term contributions proposal and a short-term, so an LT and ST. And so the long-term is um, maximum contract duration of six months and with a monitoring frequency of monthly and the funding range, range can be from 50,000 to 150,000. And the ST projects, the maximum contract duration, three months and monitoring frequency fortnightly, a uh, uh, funding range of 25,000 to 75,000. Now these funding ranges are um, the cost of personnel inclusive 25% overhead and travel and subsistence um, as well. And it'll uh, have, uh, based upon a cost reimbursement contract. Next slide. So <clears throat> um, what I was saying earlier was that the idea for the project is to um, have a mechanism for the uh, results uh, that are coming out of the different NGI topics themselves uh, to be uh, teamed up with a U.S. partner um, and then carry out experimentation of those results on either a, um, a U.S. or an EU experimental platform. So <clears throat> what we've decided to do is in our first open call is, um, uh, is to focus on the three call topics uh, that have already had about a year or, or so um, running open calls. So therefore there would be some good results coming out that we could then um, you know, feed in their results uh, to do some experimentation with uh, some excellent US teams. So the first uh, top three call topics that we're, co or that we're covering in the open call number one is privacy and trust enhancing technologies. And <clears throat> so this is you know, looking at experimentation of results related to the development of robust and easy to use technologies to help users gain improved trust and greater control when sharing their personal data attributes and information. Uh, then decentralized data governance. Um, so this is experiment, experimentation of results um, related to leveraging distributed open hardware and software ecosystems based on blockchains, distributed ledger technology, open data and peer-to-peer -peer technologies with a particular focus on ethical, legal, and privacy issues, as well as concepts of autonomy, data sovereignty, and ownership values and regulations. And the third topic then is discovery and identification technologies. So looking at experimentation of results um, related to new methods of search and discovery, access of large heterogeneous data sources, services, objects, and sensors, devices, multimedia content, et cetera. So as Peter was saying earlier, there could be some possibilities here, perhaps as to seeing how large amounts of data um, related to you know the health health fields um, could be could be leveraged um, you know to deal with um, you know uh, health crises uh, like like we have at the moment. So again, I just want to point out here that um, that even though these uh, the open call topics are specifically focused on the three up and running projects. Um, it's not just open for the, uh, the projects that are, are in uh, those, uh, those particular um, NGI RIAs that I outlined earlier. It's also open to all innovators. So if there's other innovators that have ideas <clears throat> that can be um, tested here or prototyped here with the US partner, then, um, then, then that's fine. And then, as I'll explain later, likewise, if there's U.S. partners that want to team up, that are doing some of this work and want to team up with EU partners, perhaps in an experimental platform in the in the EU, that's also possible as well. Or if you want to team up with some of the the projects that are already funded, um, like I, I see a, a question earlier about how to get more details about the um, um, the ledger. Uh, the ledger project, you know, perhaps there's some projects that are already um, being funded in ledger that you might be able to work with and then team up with a U.S. partner 
Um, so we'll, we'll share uh, information on, on how to get you the information on those uh, open call results. Next slide, please. So the, um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of the experimental platforms, um, the calls are open to all EU or US experimental platforms or even some combination. So if you wanna look at some work involving federation of platforms um, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in the open call, that, that's uh, welcome as well. So just some you know, examples of the types of platforms that could be involved um, are on the EU side, there's uh, you know, the NGI EXP, which is the NGI experimentation um, which covers sort of a, a broad spectrum of, um, of different projects coming out of like the former FIRE program in, in the EU. Um, it, and uh, one of the uh, uh, ones that's still running is the Fed for FIRE Plus project, you know, so that there's excellent scope to, um, to you know, use the Fed for FIRE um, experimental platform. Then there's also the 5GPP projects which are running that have a, a large amount of, um, uh, of, of experimental platforms uh, related to 5G across different vertical sectors. Um, uh, and you know, th there's quite a large uh, scope there as well, and then potentially others. Then in the US, there's the NSF's wired and wireless funded program. So on the wired side, you would have uh, ENTER which um, is the, um, um, the follow-up to the Gini network, then Fabric, which uh, we'll present a little bit later, and also the Future Cloud Platform have, um, have already expressed some inter a considerable interest with us as well. Um, then on the wireless side, you have the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research Program of the NSF, uh, which we'll um, present a little bit later, then US Ignite, and then also, there was a dedicated US-EU Internet Core and Edge ICT program, which is, has been running since um, 2018 and is still running. And um, these projects have teamed up with us and we're uh, currently compiling their links in the twinning lab. And they're very interested to continue uh, working uh, with EU partners um, in, in the future through the ngiatlantic.eu open calls. Next slide. So just some examples of uh, the, the types of EU US project teams. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one example could be an innovator in the EU that's developed an NGI based solution to improve new ways of search and discovery functionality. And they want to team up with a US based experimental platform funded by the NSF. You know, that, so that would be a, a you know, a typical um, EU US team for, for uh, the open call. Then um, another example would be perhaps a, a, an in innovator in the US uh, with, who's funded by the NSF under one of the programs has developed an NGI based solution on decentralized data governance that wants to team up with an EU based partner who has already developed something similar, you know, perhaps fun either funded already through um, NGI Ledger or, or even, you know, uh, develop on their own and then uh, team up for further development and testing on an EU-based experimental platform. So, for example, Fed for Fire or 5GPP. So this would be an ideal, you know, um, you know a, a nice team for an EU-US collaboration. Okay, so as Sarah mentioned before, in both of these examples, um, according to the funding rules, we would be funding the EU-based partners and um, then the, the funding from the US partners would come um, from you know, either their existing project funds or if there's some new uh, US EU project funds, for example, similar to the ICT program that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Okay, so the evaluation criteria, there's, uh, there's four criterion um, with a scoring of one to 10. So the first criteria is the soundness of the proposal and foreseen impact on the open call topic. And that would be ra uh, rated at 30%. There's technical excellence and adherence to the call open topics, that's 30%. 
experience, experience and qualifications of the applicant, that's 20%, and the economics of the proposal, 20%, and then the final scoring and ranking will be automatically determined by averaging, um, and the, uh, we will have um, three independent evaluators um, that are, are evaluating the proposals. Next slide, please. Who can receive financial support? Um, <clears throat> public and private organizations of any size, not individual researchers. As I mentioned before, there are some um, of the NGI RIA projects which do fund individuals, but in our case, um, we, we, we won't be funding individual researchers. Um, located within the EU member states or associated countries and twinned with the US counterpart, uh, as described earlier, to carry out the activities proposed. And again, as I mentioned, the funding is limited to the coverage of the work to be carried out by the EU team. Next slide, please. So we will have uh, some supporting documents. Um, it already available is the Frequently Asked Questions uh, link, which, which we'll share here. The full open call text will be available soon on the website and a general information presentation. And then the following uh, documents will be available when the first open call opens. You'll have the template in PDF and Word formats, which you'll um, see will be considerably shorter than the typical you know, H2020 um, project um, formats. Um, and then also we'll have the standard contract for successful proposals will be available when the open call opens. So this way you'll be able to review this um, um, right up front. And we just want to point out if for some reason you cannot make it in the um, a proposal to the open call number one, don't worry, there's four more open calls launch scheduled. And we've taken the view that we will be running them about every two to three months um, instead of once a year. So <clears throat> you'll have plenty of scope and opportunity to, um, to get involved in open calls. The second open call will open in August of 2020. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, we are running a little bit um, let's say later compared to the schedule, but we, we already have some questions specific um, uh, for the open call. Uh, so I'd maybe suggest that we address some of them before we move on to even presentation about the experimental platforms, if you agree. Yes, that's okay. Okay, so I'll try to read them all. So there was one question by Marco Ruffini. If an experiment needs some additional equipment consumable to be carried out, can this be charged to the project? So Jim, uh, um, <clears throat> I would imagine it would be able to, but I would just have to confirm and it would have to follow the same, um, you know, the, the same uh, rules that, that apply in the H2020 um, pro uh, you know, projects, you know, such as, um, you know, the way that equipment is, um, is charged to you know, a regular program. But, but uh, I'll just have to check on that and get back to you. Yeah, the, the idea, I mean, it, of course, is to be as close as possible to the um, beneficiaries. And um, so for sure, um, personal costs, overhead and travel uh, will be covered as it happens in for other European uh, funded projects. But uh, as said, we will try to uh, um, pre foresee uh, details about this in the call that is going to be published soon. Um, then another question by uh, Guillaume Lepalud. Are you looking at a specific NGI application areas industries for the project result? I think this uh, was addressed by Jim presenting the uh, topics of the first uh, open call. Uh, Jim, do you want to add anything to that? So that we identify yeah, yeah. those three areas. Yeah, go on. Yeah, uh, like <clears throat> in terms of the, you know, the topic areas that, that I covered those three topic areas, now within those, of course, we could, um, you know, you could have different NGI application areas um, and industries. So, you know, as Sarah had in her slides, 
you know, she showed the 5G, IoT, big data, uh, cybersecurity, and so on. You know, um, so those those areas would would certainly apply, you know, within those three kind of umbrella topic areas that um, that we're covering. And and this this is uh, the way it has happened in in the NGI RIA projects that are funding currently funding open calls that they're they're open to a number of application areas a number of industries yeah. a number of verticals so so yes absolutely you can um you can propose in you know in any of those you know it could be health it could be agriculture it could be smart cities you know uh, i think it it should depend on you know on who your partner is in in the u.s and i i think when you hear the presentation from yvonne about what platforms you know they have in the u.s it might generate some some ideas for this for you okay then there was another question about ipr uh, so by martin seran again uh, in particularly in case of ideas that generate how and management this will be included in the um uh, in the contracts so i believe so jim do you want to specify any, anything else yes yeah, so like um you know what we will be doing is we're providing mentoring um and and help to the projects in conjunction with our um ngi project um tetra um, who we're looking at sort of okay. technology transfer and harvesting of results um, into the marketplace. So, you know, we, we will be able to assist the projects, uh, you know, once we know the details of, of the projects, we will be able to assist them in, you know, in this, uh, you know, IPR will obviously be one of the, um, you know, one of the topics that, that we can help them with. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm looking at the time. I know Peter might have to leave in a few minutes. So while we continue with those of you who can stay, Peter, do you want to um, say something more? We, of course, uh, thank you very much for, for joining the webinar today. Yep, uh, no, may, many thanks for, for having me in this conversation. I think what is clearly what we understand from that webinar and from this conversation is that this is in an experiment in itself. So I think one needs to be fair and, and give yourself the space as well of building this initiative. This isn't what has been done before. So I think when Jim tries to answer questions, it's not that he looks up in a in a manual and says, okay, that's the answer to that question. I think there's a lot of flexibility maybe in the system, but that shouldn't be misconstrued as everybody does whatever they want. So I think this ability of having a strategy and enjoying your flexibility is something which is probably for you as running these projects or, or running this ecosystem is not easy to manage but i i greatly appreciate you take up that 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 uh, responsibility or that burden in, in building that and i wish you all the best and for the community please swamp them with proposals thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much peter Okay, so moving on with some other questions about the topics of the upcoming calls. Have then already been decided? And no, I said we will be monitoring the trends uh, following the uh, proposals we receive, and each call will have its dedicated uh, topic, uh, focus topics. And in terms of list of topics with expertise required, available, offered, so everything will be detailed in the form itself. So it will be structured enough to allow you to uh, provide uh, those details while uh, saying we'll try to keep it um, as simple as possible. Uh, there's a question about, uh, uh, so if you US company partners for one of these projects, are we required to fund money from US sources or fund it through our own business? Uh, that, that's a good one. Um, for sure, I mean, yeah, the, this uh, project only funds EU, um, uh, EU partners, so other resources will be needed. Yes, I, I would say the answer would be, it would be up to the, you know, yeah. the U.S. team members. So, you know, if um, if you want to get it from a U.S. source, you would have to 
um, you know, put together a business case or, you know, maybe, maybe some sort of proposal for them and then, you know, ask them, you know, whether it, mm -hmm. it would be, um, you know, possible to get funding for, you know, for this project. Um, or if, you know, in some cases, um, we've actually been approached by some um, US funded projects that already have funds and, you know, they, they want to team up with someone in the EU to do a particular part of their, of their uh, project. <clears throat> so, you know, that's a case where they're funding it through their own um, project fund, you know, mm -hmm. so, so it's really up to the, to the US uh, team member to decide, you know, whether they get funds from somewhere else or they, they fund it through their own, own sources. Great. Uh, there is a question about any place by Francesco D'Andre, any place to do networking in EU, US. So the first channel that I would suggest is the Twinning Lab, since this is area available from the NGI Atlantic website, where we're going to collect and then launch and present the uh, interested stakeholders uh, with the idea exactly to match make uh, the skills and NGI uh, topics addressed. We are also uh, for sure organizing, uh, if not physical events, other virtual events, and we are leveraging on the entire NGI community for this. So yeah, stay in touch absolutely uh, with all our channels. And I'm trying to catch all the questions. Um, there are some also in the chat. Um, for non-academic researchers, um, how can we partake on this? Okay, yeah, the, the, uh, another question about partnerships. So rely on the Twinning Lab. Um, how long do you plan for review on the project? So this should be quite short. As uh, anticipated by Jim, we foreseen uh, the start of the first uh, experiments already in July. And I hope I've read them all. Um, just on the networking question, um, yeah. I, I just want to point out that the, um, the experimental platform projects in the US um, have yeah. had their own scheduled events. And you know, now, obviously, you know, due to the COVID-19 situation, many of them have virtual events, um, such as the Fabric project is having a virtual workshop in, um, in April. And we can share the details of this, and, and they're very, very willing to have um, EU people participate to their workshop. And perhaps yeah. uh, Yvonne, you might even know about some more of, of these kind of events. Thanks, Jim. Good point. So I kindly invite all of you to stay a few minutes longer, since Ivan now is going to introduce some examples of experimental platforms. Ivan. The yeah, to you. Can, I, can I take over this slideshow? I hope you can see my slide. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. So uh, <clears throat> I'll try to do, to speed up through this. I have way too many slides. So, so um, I guess the main idea here is just to sort of um, highlight a few platforms that are readily available, some platforms that are coming online, and of course, more details you can certainly ask uh, us or, or look at the Twinning Labs um, site for for where we'll try to put some details on all of these now <clears throat> starting with the with the um a platform for advanced wireless research um so this is the initiative that started uh, about two years ago um where the industrial consortium provided the 50 million dollar um in kind and in cash contribution and the national science foundation um provided another 50 million dollars with the idea that you know this large amount of money can be used to sort of deploy um three to four city scale deployments and as peter mentioned in the introduction focus is really on wireless and and um it's actually getting even more heated right now uh this this quest to get uh, fully uh software wise uh wireless platforms and and sort of create an open source ecosystem for for wireless and um, the um, plan was to sort of run this for about five years. Of course, the funding is, is there for the first uh, 
couple of years in the initial deployment, and the assumption is that the platforms will uh, very quickly be become self-sustainable. And we are seeing actually quite a lot of uh, 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 interest in from from everybody to make sure these platforms are uh, sustained beyond the initial funding. Now, two platforms were awarded in the early 2018. One platform was awarded in the late 2019. And the last platform is expected to be awarded sometime this year. And we are in the various stages of deployment. Um, the first two platforms were Salt Lake City and New York City. Um, and, and by the way, I'm a program director for the New York City Cosmos platform. And so I'll, I'll, I'll speak mostly about it, but I do have a few slides explaining the other two platforms. So the, the Powder platform is really focused on the software-defined network uh, radios and, and software-defined networking. Um, with the assumption that um, most uh, environments consist on, on, on three types, either a campus type of environment, the suburban environment, and the dense urban environment. And you can actually see on the deployment map down at the, at the bottom of the slide, on the right-hand side, you see the Utah, University of Utah campus. In the middle, you have sort of a low-rise uh, suburban type of environment. And on the left-hand side is the downtown uh, Salt Lake City, where you have uh, high-rise buildings, right? They are also partnering with the Renew project, which is um, providing these uh, massive MIMO type of uh, radios. And by the way, the, most, uh, the infrastructure is really fully software-defined um, in both terms of radio and, and networking and computing, and therefore, um, is a perfect playground for uh, this, um, these efforts uh, along the lines of ORAN and ONAP type of deployments. The second platform, and I'm sorry, is the Cosmos. And of course, I will spend um, a few slides on, on explaining what Cosmos is all about. Um, I guess the most interesting aspect of Cosmos is the fact that it's deployed in, in Harlem, um, in New York City. Um, and of course, um, Hopefully nobody is doing experiments right now because that's uh, sort of one of the hot areas with the with the virus. Um, but the the focus is really on the um, the millimeter wave uh, as well as sub six gigahertz wideband types of uh, signal processing um, and the um, the infrastructure behind the whole software defined radio uh, wideband software defined radio is really. A uh, fairly uh, massive CPU, GPU, FPGA type of infrastructure that is needed to support these these novel types of uh, wireless deployments. Now, uh, probably for this community, most interesting aspect of Cosmos is the optical networking that sits on the bottom of it. So, in addition to uh, massive software-defined radios, mass massive computing, and and uh, 100 gigabit per second. Ethernet, Ethernet connectivity between these devices. Uh, on the lower layer, we have a fully programmable optical layer. And actually, we did have some of the European partners already playing with that stuff. And um, the core of it is obviously this fully programmable optical uh, switch, as well as, as a massive RODAM deployment uh, that allows people to create arbitrary topologies. And again, I apologize for breezing through these, but you know the idea is is just to give you a, a sort of a, a first impression of what's available, and then you can certainly uh, we can certainly help uh, answering any questions or providing more information. Uh, there is, as I said, massive cloud infrastructure around these software-defined radios and programmable optical um, devices. Uh, that's of course uh, contains all three. Uh, mainstream processing technologies, CPU, GPU, and FPGA. Um, now, um, we are currently uh, done with the pilot deployment, which of course means that we have a couple of data centers, uh, optical layer uh, fully deployed, and uh, a number of sites. Um, the phase, we are currently in the phase one, where we are now expanding the footprint of the deployment along Amsterdam Avenue. And of course, phase two will then include the Broadway and a couple of other areas in the city. The third project, uh, which was just awarded last, uh, at the end of the last year, is the AirPop project. Um, and the idea here is to sort of um, support experimentation with unmanned aerial systems and, and their use in both um, 
management of unmanned aerial systems as well as as in in using them for to provide wireless connectivity and so uh of course um it has all sorts of elements that are uh, necessary to support something like this including remote drone operators which are required to sort of do experiments so it's it's if anybody's interested in how to do a sort of real time or near real time um cyber physical type of experiments airport platform is obviously um the platform of choice um as i said it was just awarded so it will be sometime before it's fully deployed but uh once once it is it will be deployed in the university of uh, uh north carolina um chapel hill so, so you know this is sort of uh just shows you the area where it's deployed and the final thing i really want to talk about is and, and it was already mentioned um, a couple of times is the fabric project which also started last year where as you can see there is a massive uh deployment of fiber across the country um where we have uh, two types of networking high speed super core and and which is which is really provided by esnet and it's a terabit uh per second type of deployment and the uh to which a uh, number of satellite or edge sites uh, including all the the power, uh, power sites are connected through the 100g dedicated uh DWDM core um so it's as you can see it's it's a fairly um large footprint dedicated network uh, to do networking experiments and the interesting aspect of it is that at each point of presence uh, of this network you have a a, a fairly sophisticated node uh, which in, connect contains um, all sorts of uh, programmable components including the FPGA based uh, and P4 network processors uh, that are sort of uh, probably interesting in the NGI context uh, more than anything else and so this is where I would stop um, and hopefully I was able to bring back some time um and of course apologize for for a fairly uh large number of slides thank you ivan um, i'm sure uh, this was well received by everybody and i've seen there is there was another question that might be of interest for others uh, uh, if research academic uh is it necessary that U.S. Pattern is a research academic or can be innovation organizations such as an accelerator facilitator so they can be either so uh, all actors are uh, welcomed and um, I'm sure there's, there are there's other questions. Question. There's also a question here for Ivan um, on who are the users typically for the, the different platforms uh, Ivan you know the uh, smartphone type type uh, users or <laughs> so so yeah that's a so so most of these facilities or at least in terms of power and especially fabric right are meant to be uh, sort of remote avail remotely available facilities now if anybody wants to do a a sort of user study where somebody will walk around and and carry a cell phone um that would have to be arranged in somehow and um maybe even uh requires that participants come to the to the platform and, and do their experiments great so um a couple of practical information the slides and the recordings of this webinar will be soon available from the uh, nj atlantic website from the webinars page uh, we have an faq question page as well that we're going to implement with the questions we've just received and possibly with, with also uh, more. And as said, we in, really invite you to stay in touch and use the channels uh, we, we have to, such as the newsletters where that we'll be using for sending updates about the open call. Um, there is one last minute uh, yeah, question. Is it possible to test new hardware? in those platforms yes so yes, I thanks even yeah. yes. okay unless there is any other burning I questions might just add there that you were saying ivan it, it might be necessary for um you know people to go there so as part of our projects there, there's obviously travel budgets for the eu participants to go 
you know, to, to carry out tests or, you know, um, set up, set yeah. up um, yeah. equipment, that sort of stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if people are bringing, if, if it's bring your own device, then of course, uh, somebody has to be on site. <clears throat> okay. okay. So we are <laughs> seven minutes over. I hope you have addressed all the questions and that you really, I mean, that you enjoyed this webinar. So, yeah, thank you very much on behalf of the NGI Atlantic Consortium and we look forward to, to receiving all your proposals. Stay in touch and thank you very much. Stay, stay safe. Thank you for everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye all. Bye-bye.